button. We're on. Okay, Jeff, thanks for joining me uh, in this chat. This is uh, for the AI Hub and uh, a, a webazine, and I've recorded um, like, I don't know, four or five different conversations. And I sort of started out thinking, what is AI? But it really started out with an old friend of mine, Michael Jordan, who had written a uh, several articles, one in Medium, and I wrote a uh, reply to his, which got some attention, uh, mainly from Mike. And <laughs> he, he was, <laughs> so he and I had this discussion, and it was really, I disagreed so much with him that uh, I wanted to just see what was going on because obviously if you even if you haven't been paying attention you, you'll notice something is happening you know cars are driving themselves protein folding there's just all this stuff sorry, going sorry, on you, yeah go ahead sorry it's no problem I'm, I'm getting a reflection of me I, I, you're good some, oh okay Okay, I was pausing the I was pausing the image of me wrong and seeing a bit of your new image. Okay, no, I'm 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 recording it at this end, so it has no your sorry. I'm, I'm, yeah, no, that's okay. Really that's okay. This this is meant to be a conversation. I'm not. I have no script. I, I actually I have a a, a nice pad, uh, which is uh, a remarkable, which is something Dave Rumelhart was doing back in the '80s. You know, handwriting recognition. And right. it basically, the thing I like about it, it simulates paper. It feels like paper. Yeah. And I don't know what they're doing. I mean, it's some kind of, you know, ink nano bot thing that they've got going on here, but it's uh, very impressive. And so uh, I have some notes, but I, I, don't really, I don't really use them. And so going back to the, the way this uh, struck me, because this is relevant to, I think, where I'd like to, you know, maybe orient the conversation and you can go wherever you like with it is you know he he was basically saying that the, the deep learning kind of phenomena that's happening right now if we you know i almost think of it as like the beatles sort of when they appeared <laughs> beetle mania started we're in sort of deep learning mania if you will uh but there's a lot of good things happening too and you know as i pointed out to him you know protein folding i mean what you know, and he said, I agree, but of course they didn't solve the problem. <laughs> I said, yeah, okay, but that's, you're, you're, you're sort of uh, cr creating these diminishing kind of comments to create an atmosphere of, you know, this is going to fail. The AI winter is going to come. You're, you're just, you're, it's, like, it's like some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy on your part. Why are you doing this? Don't you realize that you know, you're like the only person who doesn't get this? Anyway. So he's not the only person. No, the I know. Not, well, now I know that because I've got, you know, I, I have, uh, and I'll warn you, this is a Gary Marcus uh, no zone, so I won't talk about him. And I still oh, I was about to talk about him. I don't think we want to talk about him. I, in 2015, he made a prediction that computers will be able to do machine translation. Yes, I know. Yeah, but, you know, Gary, Gary is the most inconsistent consistently inconsistent person I know he's a, a but uh, but I've known him for a long time. anyway I knew Michael back in graduate school and uh, at that point he was always kind of focused on the margins of things as far as I could tell back then so I don't want this to become uh, a psychiatric but there, there's a sense in which he really is rejecting this strong and he and he's an interesting character in this now you, on the other hand, have had, I mean, at, at least what I've heard you say in other uh, contexts is that deep learning concerns you. I mean, that, the, and I think also uh, Yosha Benjo has had a lot of sort of concerns about, say, well, we're doing classification learning, it works well, but how does it relate to human thought and reasoning and, you know, all the wonderful things humans do? Now, I, I'm being a psychologist and, and uh, having two uh, brain imaging scanners now, and I've scanned 10,000 people by now, I'm much less impressed by what humans can do. Uh, a, as you see, it re reverts down to a couple networks in the brain that are interacting in interesting ways. And there's a lot of, you know, neuroimaging is definitely going this way towards network science. There's no question there's some collision coming in here between artificial intelligence and the network sort of science is coming out of that and the network science is coming out of brain imaging which is just 
taken it over. So I, I just was very uh, excited about this when I started to think about it. And uh, so I just wanted to toss it out uh, to, to see what, what, what you think is happening right now. What's, what's going on? Okay, so I think one thing that's been fairly clearly established by the research on deep learning, which is that if you do stochastic gradient descent on a lot of parameters, then amazing things will happen. Right. Like you'll be able to generate whole stories. Or like you'll be able to integrate symbolic expressions um, and be able to compete with things like Maxima at integrating symbolic expressions. So that's quite extraordinary. Yeah. Or you'll be able to do machine translation, which should be the preserve of pure symbolic AI, if anything must be. Um, what it doesn't show, for example, is that the brain is using back. So I spent a long time trying to figure out how the brain could do back prop. Um, I'm still trying to figure it out. I still don't think it's impossible. I mean, my, my argument is you could take a stem cell and you could turn it into an eyeball or a tooth. Right. Well, if you can do that, you can surely <laughs> turn it into something that does back prop. Um, but right. the question is, is back prop the algorithm the brain's using? And I'm beginning to think it's probably not. I see. So, so really, and that's kind of what I, uh, it struck me about this time period in you know 2007 8 9 up to 2012 was that if you know i was still back in the 80s and i time traveled into this time period i'd say well relu units and dropout i don't i don't see it just looks like back propagation to me <laughs> in, in huge networks N not much has changed except in some sense, the parameterization, which you just brought up. There's a huge number of parameters in this thing, which, of course, from a purely classical statistical point of view, just can't possibly work. It can't really do anything without strong regularization. And, and in, you know, what, what do we have? A thousand layers with billions of and trillions of weights. I, think, I mean, this is absurd, right? That can't work. Well, um, there's two issues. But it there's does. One. There's one, um, does it fit statisticians' idea of how you build a model? Right. Which is, you better have less parameters than data. It better be um, linear, Gaussian, and five parameters, yes. I think that's a bit unfair. No, I mean, they're more oh, going beyond all that. <laughs> but they certainly believe you ought to have less parameters than bits in the data. Yes, yes. Um, and what we've discovered is that great big neural nets um, work pretty well and surprisingly well. And so what's really weird is you can have a neural net with enough parameters so that it can learn to associate outputs with inputs even if the outputs are made entirely random. Yeah. And that same yeah, net, if the that. outputs aren't entirely random, yeah. and so it's way over-parameterized, will go off and find the structure in the data and generalize really nicely. And that's very weird. No, it is. And and it I, I don't see why statisticians aren't you know, and I, I take uh, Mike Jordan as a pretty good statistician, why they're not worried about what that means. And uh, the attitude is this kind of fallback to, well, it really shouldn't work. I mean, I've heard people, I've heard very, very well-educated statisticians tell me that can't work. And, and people who, you know, help define certain fields in multivariate statistics, that cannot work, I'm told. And then I point out, but it does work. So wouldn't it be better to try to develop some theory about this, about why it's working? Indeed. <laughs> and there is a sort of, I mean, there's a very simple theory, um, which is that it's basically early stopping. Um, <laughs> I don't so, that. for example, if you take MNIST, <laughs> yeah, there's, take MNIST. there's 60,000 training examples. Sure. So I tried training a network using backcrop um, with a few tricks um, that has the kind of same ratio of parameters to training examples yeah. as the brain has. So if you take the brain, and let's suppose that each fixation is a training example. Now in your life, you live about, you make about five to 10 billion fixations in your life. So let's say 10 billion fixations. Um, but you have like 100 trillion synapses. Yeah. So the ratio, so you can burn like 10,000 or 100,000 synapses per fixation. So if you do the same with MNIST, you, you end up thinking that you're gonna need 
something like half a billion parameters to do MNIST at yeah. that level of profligacy. Um, and if you train a net like that, it works. Hmm. And the reason it works is because it very quickly gets to making zero errors on the training data. Right. So, um, I mean... And certainly with early stopping, you can understand why a big system with a lot of parameters, um, if it gets the training data right, it'll stop learning. And you don't. Know, Right, right, right. But, but, but there is a, there is a, I mean, there is a, you know, I, I've actually looked at a lot of learning curves in uh, deep learning systems. And I, I was really interested in learning curves, you know, going back to when I was first doing animal conditioning research. And the learning curves there were always negative exponentials, that were, you know, based on Hall's theories and so on. But there is a, there is an interesting um, uh, side view of this that, that came from Thurnstone and other of these early uh, psychometricians who uh, uh, were talking about hyperbolic structures. Now these structures do exactly what you just said. They have a small incubation time and then they shoot. And it's almost like there's a kind of, a, let's say it's a convolutional network, there's a kind of resolution of feature structures that all of a sudden once start to crystallize, then the thing basics up. I can, I, I could get this to zero error right now. <laughs> it's done, you know. And and it looks like many times these systems are behaving this way, but especially when there's many, 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 many layers. So it it led me to hypothesize the proposition that it's not so much all the tweaks and various gradients sand and whether backpropagation is the brain otherwise. But these layers are terribly important in the kind of uh, reconnoitering of the information somehow. The, the, the exploration and its, and its reduction are critical to, these, the, to, the, to lots of layers. Now I had a student who actually went off to Google and he's running some group up there and I talked to him uh, a couple years ago, and I said, "So how how do you you know what do you decide to do to make it work better?" And I forget I forget their their particular task, probably speech recognition. And he says, "Well, we just add more layers." <laughs> and I'm like, that sounds like a bad idea to me. <laughs> he says, "But it works." And so it's the old you know, you remember uh, Alan Lapides had an old uh, phrase. He said, uh, "The fairy dust approach: just sprinkle with hidden units, and it will work." Yep. And this is almost like the sprinkle with layers and it will work. But it's fairly clear with the brain. Um, yes. So the equivalent of layers in the brain is cortical areas. That's right. Not, and you got, the of and you got six. And you got six um, of them. You don't have this very deep hierarchy of cortical areas. Even yes. Van Essen only has it about sort of five to ten areas deep between yes. yeah. the input and the hippocampus. And That's right. Yes, right. So the cortex isn't like that. Right, but 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 the argument might be that you know if we consider uh, recurrent networks or feedback networks, some cyclic structures, certainly, then certainly virtually we could have many many layers in that virtual structure as we unfold it. Right, it's just a matter that we're basically processing in a kind of this recursive way till we. Sure. Yeah. But then then it gets even less brain-like because. <laughs> as soon as you take these recurrent nets and ask, well, how do they train them? Yeah. They train them by backdrop through time. Yeah. And there's no way in hell the brain is doing backdrop through time. Well, I don't, I don't, I'm do, I don't know why you say that so strongly. I think, I mean, there are many ways in which one could uh, construct some kind of wet tissue to do something like uh, error propagation if there's. Uh, symmetry, you know, if there's like two parallel systems that have some way to communicate, and one of them sending errors and the other one's dealing with the information, but yeah, they're but connected th together in a in no, a sympathetic way. No, think of yeah, think of video. Now think of these systems that do backcrop through time for understanding video. Yeah, and require recurrent net. Yeah, there's no way you can be pipelining the visual input. And using your hardware in a pipeline so you can process it in real time. Okay. And do backcrop through time. It, they're just completely incompatible. Well, you need some delay. There has to be some way to to phase, you know, off phase basically, the information. Basically, you can't do pipeline if you have backcrop through time. Oh, I understand. I understand. But uh, I mean, but if you consider that the visual input from the retina back to V1 is you know, almost 200 milliseconds. I mean, we're living in a very slow world as it is. 
And so you could, you know, the cerebellum's got a lot of room. We could stick it in there and basically yeah, yeah. simulate it and then pop out every once in a while. So, I mean, th there's bigger systems here. And, and of course, the feed forward structures that, you know, have been the focus for 40, 50 years are not in the brain. I grant you that. But I, I don't, I, I think this, this borders on proof by lack of imagination at this point, like uh, Rumhart used to say. I agree. So I have my favorite argument is Chomsky thought language can't be learned because he couldn't see how you could learn it. Right. That's right. That's right. And he's still saying, and, and I think he was presented recently with some deep learning results and he, he just, he, you know, he's older, but he just kind of shook his head and said, ridiculous neural networks can't work or something I don't know uh, but it, it didn't really go on. You know, one of the thing one of the things historically that caught me here too and not that I, I, I want to you know uh, digress in various directions but I will a little bit is that it seems to me unlike what looks like the first AI winter which had to do with the deconstruction of the perceptron and so on and, uh, unless you believe Schmidt humor, which which I don't, but if, <laughs> which involves Russians and, and UFOs and something else, I don't know what he what he's on to now. And, and I like Jurgen. Yeah, I I, 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 I get I, along I with Jurgen. I think that's unfair on Schmidt. I I'm having a conversation he's, with Jurgen. He's a very good researcher. Just I I know he is, and I've had you. I've had long conversations much worse than this with him. So it's and I'm going to he's going to join me sometime in January for this. So this will be a fun one. But uh, it's it's a sense in which there was more like a pause or al almost like an incubation or you know it, the, the the whole thing was being marinated. It wasn't stopped it was just kind of sitting waiting for something to happen and these uh, other kinds of innovations in technology and compute cycles and curated data and all of that then uh, and I, I don't know I mean you were you were there when this happened so and I I was still wondering what was going on uh, it just exploded I mean is that how it kind of felt is that this was just you know, once there was some kind of, see, you never gave up on any of these ideas. So once it sort of hit, you had to, you had to actually have predicted this somehow. Yeah, I mean, it seemed to me that the brain's got to learn somehow. And the brain <laughs> doesn't learn yeah. by being told statements in symbolic logic. Exactly, and, exactly. And yeah. figuring out their entailments. That's not how the brain works. No. It clearly works by having huge vectors of neural activity that interact with each other. Um, and so we've just got to figure out how these vectors get constructed and how they interact. And that's got to be what's going on. And so from my point of view, there never was an alternative to neural networks. Um, it, the alternatives were just silliness. And there was silliness that depended on people not being, biolo not being having any biological insight. They thought that somehow um, the essence of intelligence was symbolic reasoning and they thought that symbolic reasoning had to involve using symbols inside your head yeah. and all of that was just crazy Well, so I had a very nice test for whether people were crazy or not um, <laughs> which is suppose you could understand a rat and you could really really understand a rat in the way a physicist understands you know a, a ball falling, falling off a tower um, would you be more or less than halfway to understanding human intelligence? And it seems to be just obvious that if you could understand a rat, you were most of the way there. And then on top of that, there was language and other stuff, but basically you understood how the thing worked. Right. And I tried this question on Steve Pinker, and Steve Pinker was convinced that you were much less than half of the way there. Yeah. And it's just a question of hubris. It's a question of thinking That's there's right. something really special about us. And of course, there are lots of special things about us. But the, the essence of how how brains work and how they manage to do things in the world that applies to rats as well as to us. And if you can understand Absolutely. a rat, Absolutely. you'd be most of the way there. Well, this was this was the early you know nineteenth century kind of view in psychology that we're going to start with simple organisms and somehow this will generalize. Now, to some extent, that program hadn't worked or hasn't worked, and it's partly because language did become kind of the hobby horse of certain psychologists, not, not all of them, but then the basic processes really, you know, 
uh, from the 50s hasn't changed that much in terms of attention and memory and episodic memory. The structures that we, it's just there's more we know about them. Do we know enough to actually simulate it? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But we're, we're on the right track. So I agree with you in that perspective. But then we've got this thing that just happened again. I, I, it's so, there's so many good retreads these <laughs> days <laughs> back to the 80s, one of being explainable AI. And I just love the term explainable because, you know, it gets down to what is an explanation here? Do we really want the... Uh, the CIFAR network that just learned about cats and dogs all of a sudden say, I know what a cat is. <laughs> a cat is, you know, this kind of... Now, you might be able to construct explanations from information inside the network, but that seems to me to be an entirely different function, and it also isn't going to allow you to reconstruct that network. It's not, it's not, you know, if I can explain to you how to play tennis, you're not going to be able to play tennis when I'm done. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> My favourite example is with handwritten digi recognition. Yeah. So you, I, I can make a neural network that does very well at handwritten digi recognition, and um, people would like an explanation of how it works. And the way it works is it's got a whole bunch of weights in it, and you put these weights through these functions, and out comes the answer. That's how it works. <laughs> and if you want to know more about how it works, I better tell you what the weights are. Um, or at least I better show you for a very large set of examples the mapping from input to output. If I show you that, that's enough because we know you can distill another network from that. So that contains the information, just the mapping from input to outputs. But if you want to, that's not what people want. They want a different kind of explanation. Yeah. And I've seen people in press say, well, we can explain how neural networks work. The way they recognize an object is they first derive features, and if you tell them what the features are, and then they combine these features. and there's a sense in which that's true. Yeah. But if you ask, how do you recognize the two? Right. Can you explain it? Right. And most people think they can. That's what's interesting. I say, okay, so how do you recognize how do you recognize yeah. the sum of the two? And people right. will give me an explanation. Right. And then I can find a two that completely violates that explanation. Yeah. I can find a two where the tail of the two is vertical. Yeah. Um and the fact is, we don't know how we recognize it, we can't explain it. Well, and, and, and so if you want to be confident in what these systems do, you have to do it the same way as you get confidence for people. If I show you a lot of twos and you recognize them all, then I think you're pretty good to recognize and I'm fairly confident you can read the two on my check. Um, but I don't get confidence that you can recognize the two by looking inside your brain or by asking you how you do it. Because if I ask you how you do it, you give me a piece of rubbish. That's right, and 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 again, in brain science and and cognitive neuroscience, we know there's implicit and explicit systems of the brain, the striatums, you know, in one place, and medial temporal lobes in another place, and they do different things. Now we also know they communicate, but not very well. <laughs> so you can implicitly, you can know how to make, you know, risotto or something, but I can't explain it to you. You're going to have to watch me do it, and then maybe, maybe you'll get lucky. So there, there's that. There's already that breakdown, and so I just find this kind of like a, a false dichotomy that was existing back in the '80s, and now it's come back because why? Because neural networks are working again, and people don't like that, and so now they're trying to figure out how can they? Maybe we can connect it up with some propositional logic or some symbolic, and uh, yeah, and and that that seems to be the the context for that. Sorry, go ahead. The big difference now between what happened in the last neural network winters and now, is that when the last neural network winters came along, neural networks weren't running our lives. So there were a few. There was Yang's network yeah. that read the, the, yeah. the amount on checks. Yeah. And that was used quite a lot. And neural networks were used reading postcodes and things like that. But um, actually, not that many applications. Now right. they really right. were. And right. the reason there's not going to be another winter is because they really were. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. So one of the trends out there, one of the things I, I also have noticed recently, and there was a, a group of mathematicians at uh, Institute for Advanced Study that ran a bunch of workshops. Uh, an Italian fellow, and I can't remember his name, sorry, uh, but he was kind of the leader of the group, and they then brought up people uh, to, uh, Jan was there and a few other, but they brought up people to give talks, and they were 
uh, singularly unimpressive. <laughs> and, and I thought, gosh, I'm back in the 80s again. <laughs> They're just talking about the same thing. And one of the one of the keynotes was talking about gradient descent, and I was thinking, gosh. But then I went over to the poster session where all these kids were, and I went, holy cow, what are you doing here? <laughs> this is amazing. How did you do that? What's this? And there was this recent, uh, these two characters from Facebook, uh, um, Yada and Roberts, and they wrote a 500-page book. Uh, I got a copy, they sent me a copy, and I started talking to them, <laughs> and I realized, you know, they're physicists by training, and they, you know, took kind of quantum mechanic kind of math and applied it to deep learning and started to prove uh, lots of theorems. And it, it, I don't, yeah, I'm, I want to say this is really, I mean, there were some astonishing things I read about in the book that I thought were interesting about layers and other, you know, how quickly things learn and so on. But uh, on, this, on the other hand, they couldn't answer simple questions like, well, what's a learning curve going to look like? Is there a generalization? And they couldn't say it. They, they said, well, we, we've done the general case for everything. <laughs> and that's equation 247. <laughs> I looked at it for a while and gave up. I, I don't understand quantum mechanics. So anyway, uh, I remember, uh, you know, almost 40, 50 years ago, I was at Bell Labs. Um, and I had just joined the department there, uh, which uh, Saul Sternberg ran. And you came and gave a talk. I don't know if you remember this. You came and gave a talk, and it was on bolster machines. Right. And and uh, um, uh, the guy who was uh, the director, uh, he showed up there. It, it was just a full crowd. Everyone wanted to know what a bolster machine was. And I remember David Krantz, uh, who uh, I knew pretty well, and he sort of asked you a question. He said, so, so Jeff, this is really interesting. Have you proved any theorems about it? <laughs> and I thought, even then I thought at the time, why would you want to prove theorems about this? This thing works. And, it's a, and then, of course, I realized he was asking something a little deeper. He was saying, is there a kind of a foundational basis where we can understand what the family of these things are, or how they're related in a larger sense, maybe to the brain or biology or something like this. But, you know, that was Krantz. Right? And, but, but do you think this kind of thing, this, this uh, Yada and Roberts book will have, I mean, I can't tell whether it'll have much effect on anything. I don't know. Okay, um, fair enough. It would be very nice if we really understood why over-parameterized big networks right. actually extract the regularities that we're interested in, yeah. um, as opposed to just finding some random way to fit the data. Um, <laughs> and it's presumably because fitting the data by extracting the regularities that are really there is easier than fitting it by just doing random things. Right. By extracting lots of regularities is just there because of sampling error. Right. 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 Um, but in the meantime, there's lots of experimental work to be done. Lots of work to be done developing oh. better algorithms. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah. So I, I had another question I used to ask people: which, which, um, if it, suppose there were two talks of NIPS, which one would you prefer to go to? One talk is about a really clever new way. <laughs> of proving a known result. <laughs> the other talk is about a new learning algorithm that is different from the existing learning algorithms with no proofs at all. Right. No idea why it works, but it seems to work. Right. Obviously. And I'm clearly the, at one end of the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, obviously the same. Me too. So, so there is a sense that, so this is also goes back to the statistical frameworks. So there is a sense in which, and this is the thing that Michael and I would always argue about, Going way back to the McDonald Pew meetings, that he, you know, he was part of that uh, at MIT at the time, and um, he um, and and Pinker, of course, was the, was the director when he was making all these things. But Michael, I would argue, about this, and he he sort of had this kind of you know with, what used to be called back in the '90s or '80s or earlier neats versus scruffy kind of idea of AI and. And the idea that uh, st statistical models were really models that were specified, and then you exploited that specification with data, and not too much data, just enough data, just the right amount of data to get the model configured 
And if you had to, and if you found that there's covariance amongst the parameters, then you should get rid of some of the parameters and just, you know, <laughs> compact them somehow. So you got ten parameters. Now you only have three, and they're actually working just fine. Uh, I I I was trained in a very different way, and uh, the idea was that, well, I'm not sure I know what the maximum likelihood model is. I, why would I? I mean, I'm modeling pigeon behavior that's, you know, they're doing some kind of operant conditioning. I'm trying to figure this out. I don't know what the right model is. So um, I had a, a statistics professor tell me, well, in that case, you, you talk about model misspecification. And the question comes down to the statistician who believes they know the model. How much risk are you <laughs> willing to suffer for model misspecification? If your linear model is that wrong and it's still okay, then somehow you've left out so much variance, so much information that you've somehow lost the fundamental aspect of the thing you're modeling. And this was the thing that caught my attention about neural networks in that time period because I was more interested in just general mathematical modeling was my God, this is like, this is this is like a giant fiesta of model misspecification. I love this. This is exactly what I wanted to do. I I want to be able to have some general universal approximator and then be able to extract the model out of it that got discovered. I don't know how the motor system works. I want it to discover something about something that it's more. Right. Yeah. So learning to me was just, you know, good model misspecification. <laughs> so, and, and of course, the statisticians just hate this stuff in that context, right? Because they, they don't want to suffer the risk of having a model that's outside the equivalence class of models they think exist. Yeah. I think it's even worse than that. Okay, good. Because <laughs> propagation is very good at squeezing a lot of information into not many parameters. Right. We run it in great big networks, have a lot of parameters. But if you run it in a smaller network, it'll do the best it can. And it'll get a lot of information into the parameters. And I don't believe that's what the brain's like. So with the neural nets we run, typically, um, we're not in the regime where you have very little data and a huge number of parameters. We are often in regimes where you have more parameters than you'd expect you could get away with. But if you look at the brain and you say it's got a hundred trillion parameters, so maybe ten trillion of those are used for vision, because we're very vision animals. Yeah. So you have these ten trillion parameters used for vision. And in your entire lifetime you only make ten billion fixations. So you've got at least a thousand parameters for perfect session, probably many more. Um, that's a very different regime from what statisticians are thinking about. And the reason we're in that regime is because supporting a synapse for your whole lifetime takes a lot less energy than making one fixation. Yeah. So we're in the regime where parameters are cheap. That's right. And doing the computation required to fit parameters is cheap. Data is expensive because that involves possibly getting killed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, but it's, all, but it's also cheap in the sense, as you point out, that, you know, saccades and uh, fixations produce an enormous amount of data in a, in a, right. in a one-year-old. Particularly for unsupervised learning. And particularly right. for unsupervised learning. And, and to the extent that one can build some kind of uh, modal distributional information from that, then you can use that to train things. Uh, but it's still the case that we that we have to understand what learning's like when you have lots of parameters per training case. Yeah. And the brain is clearly optimized for sucking as much information as it can out of a training case, not for squeezing as much information as it can into a parameter. Right. Okay, that's an interesting distinction. And that's a yeah, very that's different that's perspective it. from what most statisticians have. Yeah, and it, absolutely. it argues against backbone. And absolutely. one of the reasons I now don't believe in backbone is ah. As, as how the brain works. Here's, here's what I think is a pretty good reason. Um, suppose you ask how many parameters do you need to make a system that can translate moderately well between 50 different languages. <laughs> can translate any language into any, any other language. Right, right. Without necessarily going by our English. Um, <laughs> and can do it moderately well. And 
How many parameters do I need for that? Well, it turns out you can do that with just a few billion parameters. And if you ask, well, in terms of um, brain imaging, what's a few billion parameters? Well, I can tell you, if it was mouse, a mouse has a billion weights, a billion senses per cubic millimeter. Yeah. Um, they have to be optimized for being compact. So um, we have only a few cubic millimeters to have a billion synapses. So a billion synapses is about one voxel in the brain scan. Uh, more like, yeah, well, more like maybe 10 million, 100 million, somewhere in there. Not well, a how big are the voxels then? What's that? How big are the voxels in the uh, brain Voxels uh, in uh, fMRI or let's say two two millimeter orthonor orthonormal kind of. Okay, source. so that's that's um, eight cubic millimeters in yeah. the voxel. Yeah. And so if it was mice cortex, that would be eight billion parameters. If it's human cortex, that's probably well over a billion parameters. So uh, the point is, yeah, in okay, one okay. Voxel, in terms of connections, yes, in terms of connections, I agree. Yeah. You have enough parameters in one voxel in yeah. a brain scan to do this translation in 50 different languages. So the brain is clearly not that efficient. That is, you would be very surprised if all that knowledge of all these different languages fitted into one voxel in your brain scan. You'd expect it to take several voxels at least. <laughs> so, well, well uh, okay, go ahead, sorry. So I think backpropagation is much better at squeezing information into not many synapses than the brain is. Because right. that's not what the brain is optimized for. The brain right. is optimized for extracting a lot of information from not many fixations or not much experience. Well, 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 the thing I really enjoyed about the second version of Google Translate is that I, I, I think it was at NIPS in 2017 or 2019, I forget which one. And I went to a, um, a Google Brain poster and uh, they were doing sort of bag of words between different languages and getting really remarkable results. Now, of course, in the 80s, I had done a simple autoencoder on the brown corpus and was able to pull what I thought was syntactic structure out because I was told by linguists that you must do syntactic structure first and then semantic structure. And so that's what I, you know, so that's, so I had a thing, uh, parsnip, which would, you know, pull out some interesting syntactic stuff. At least would get philosophers to write about it. That's what really, that's the important thing here. Uh, but in this case, I, I talked to the very uh, pleasant, bright gentleman, and, and I said, so do you have a linguist working with you? Like, wh what, what's the syntax structure? I mean, there's many ways to go the syntax here. Do you, are you doing it kind of a corpus way or some? And he said, what syntax? <laughs> so I had a very interesting conversation recently with Fernando Pereira. Yeah, who's yeah, exactly. Kind of yeah. In charge of natural language processing at Google. Yeah. And um, it was about whether we'd ever go back to the idea of taking a sentence and extracting a logical form. From exactly. It. That's and what I was getting at. His right. answer was, "No, we'll never go back there." And, yeah. Um, we we know the right symbolic language to use. It's called English. <laughs> um, and the thing is. We operate on this symbolic language with this very fancy neural net processor. And so it doesn't need to be unambiguous. Right. You can use pronouns in it because the neural net processor is fine with that. Right. And he thinks the only symbolic language you have is natural language. That's right. You don't have another symbolic language inside your head that for doing inference there's with not, there's not there's not there's not a homunculus inside the homunculus with other you know with the, with Google the language of thought. On taking a sentence in a context so you might have a sentence on like and then he gave it back to him and the problem is who's he and who's him and what's it and in the context you know what that is so now you can make a neural net that will take the context plus a sentence and give you a, a version of the sentence that doesn't require the context hmm. so it'll say and then he gave it back to him and it'll say, and then he gave the soccer, then, then Jack gave the soccer ball back to Bill. Yeah, yeah. And that's symbolic processing in the sense that you start with some sentences, which are strings of symbols, and you produce a new sentence, which is a string of symbols. But the only place the symbols are are the input and the output. That's right. That's There's right. no symbols elsewhere. It's all vectors. It's all embedding vectors. Well, this is, you know, I, I almost wish Jerry Fodor could have 
lived long enough to see this because he would have hated this so much that <laughs> syntax and semantics were being, you know, kind of smushed together. And it's interesting, I, 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 you know, through the last decades, I spent a lot of time with linguists. One of my best friends is Edwin Williams, who's a, got a Chomsky number, and he's, uh, and he always said some interesting, he's a, he's a syntactician, and that was sort of, you know, where he really had impact. But he'd always say this funny thing. I said, well, so how, how are you going to, how does this connect back to semantics? So, you know, we've got this lexicon, and so these things are selected. He says, he says, no, 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 no. He says, syntax is semantics. And I said, what do you mean by that? He says, well, <coughs> it's very clear that the lexical items themselves carry this information. I'm just extracting part of it. <laughs> it sort of that would sort of make sense because you know no one else talked like him so this 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 kind of idea that syntax semantics were just really part of a larger kind of parcel and you could grab out the information you needed to map it to that other information but it does suggest there is some you know to use an old term like lingua franca there's a there's a kind of a intermediary thing that's being extracted here or is that or do you, you think you don't think I mean, the representations think, are like that i mean you're extracting stuff you're extracting these big vectors um yeah. but if you ask in terms of symbol strings is there a lingual franca inside the head yeah um we don't need them what we need is vectors inside the head we need a what say again we need vectors inside the vectors head. okay and it's, you know that little symbol that says, on some computers, it says Intel inside? <laughs> we need one on our forest that says Vectors inside. <laughs> uh, a couple of years ago, we did a, a simple uh, bilingual experiment with Spanish and English speakers, and we would give them sentences where it'd be English and there'd be a Spanish word inserted, or there'd be Spanish and an English word inserted. And what we would find, and we would basically have them uh, uh, guess what the word meant in different contexts in, in, in post-test. Uh, but during the actual processing, uh, we found, so there's a couple areas of the brain, like the visual word form area, which is in two places, symmetric like, you know, the rest of it. And we found that English and Spanish, particularly, uh, would, f would occupy the same areas of visual word form area. <laughs> so it's almost like that area was able to accommodate whatever, the, as long as they were close enough, and then the lexical access would be relatively automatic. But it, it gave you this idea that there was this kind of mosaic of things you know by, you know, the more languages are. More. Now, of course, if you knew Chinese and English, no, they pull apart. So when we've tested people with, you know, very distant languages from the the L1, uh, it they they're they're literally lateralized, uh, in, in, and so it almost it suggests they're they're making some modular kind of structure there in the whole thing. Um, so I, this so Google, uh, and I'm not talking oh, about sorry, Google. Sorry, let me let me go back to this. Okay, issue. sure, one, go ahead. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, about the question of whether we really extract syntax. Yes. So I think we really do get the difference between, like, if I have a sentence like, next weekend we shall be visiting relatives. That has two completely different senses that happen to have the same truth conditions. <laughs> so one is, next weekend what we will be is visiting relatives, versus next weekend what we will be doing is visiting, visiting relatives. relatives. Yeah. Okay? Those are two completely different senses. Yeah. And I think when you hear the sentence, you can't think both senses at the same time. Ah. When you first hear the sentence, you fix on one of those senses. Right. Just like with an echo cube, you see one way round. Sure. And then you can also see it the other way round. Sure, but it, that might be driven by context or the audience. Sure, but or the point is, we really do um, disambiguate it in the sense of settling on one of those senses. I, I get if it. if that's what you mean by syntax, that's fine. So there is... They're, they're different syntactic structures, yeah. and we hit on one of them, or sometimes we hit on the other one. Right. Um, the question is whether to get, for example, the parse tree, um, you have to have a lingua franca inside, yeah, just some symbol string, and I think not at all. So I think I actually now believe we have these 
sort of islands of agreement in the syntactic structure. And so we do parse things, but that doesn't mean we, there's a symbolic structure. Neural nets can parse things. Well, yeah, I'm not saying it's symbolic. I'm saying if you have a, a system that can parse pairwise 109 languages, okay, between the 5,000 different parsing uh, uh, tree events, you, you, uh, it, it does seem likely that if you analyze that and looked inside the network in various ways, you might be able to extract something that looked like a common I don't know, let's just call it like a, 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 a stage, a setting stage, or some, some kind of small infrastructure that then allows you to push off very rapidly in all directions. Now, I don't know what that is. I'm not going to call it a lingua franca, but I'm going to say that there's some enabling thing there that the thing yeah. has learned to do this. So, um, earlier this year, I put a paper on the web Oh. Um, about how neural networks can represent part whole structures. Oh, right. Which is about how you can um, essentially parse visual scenes um, without having to have anything explicitly symbolic inside the net. It's how you can make a system that runs on big vectors. Right. Parsing. Right. Um, and I, I do believe that we really do parse things. I just don't think that requires a lingua franca. I, I, I agree. I, I'm really not trying to reduce it to, to a symbolic and non-symbolic representation, but, I do, but I'm simply saying there's some kind of glue or something that develops that is uh, non, that, 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 that just isn't a map. I, I mean, I can, I, and I'm not denigrating maps. I think maps are all over the brain, and I think they're great, but they're, this, is, this translation machine is much more interesting than uh, mapping uh, bags of words to other bags of words. And I, 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 and I don't think it has much to do with the statistical aspects of the word distributions themselves uh, at this point. But it might have to do with the way language evolved and the way, you know, we're see, you know we see it throughout the world and, and certain languages are, uh, you know, have more similarity than others. So, um, but um, okay. So, I, I think I've, I've I, we're almost running out of time. But I did want to ask you something about these architectures, which really worries me. But, but maybe not you. Is so the uh, Google announced that there's this new GPT thing called Glam, and it has a trillion weights in it and many many layers. <clears throat> and it, it does interesting things like GPT-3 does. Now, of course, these are all a bit of a Rorschach test. It's somewhat subjective about, well, you know, if you ask GPT, they're going to take over the world. It says, no, nah, no, I won't do it. I, I, I won't be bothered by that. Right. So, so there's a sense in which it's, I, I see it as like a huge uh, uh, phrase structure blob that can find a point in space and then pull out a similar blob of uh, phase, phase structure and then and push it out there and someone will say oh that's how, that sounds good to me <laughs> but it's not it's it's fundamentally untestable right okay but but i'm saying it's much, I but, but I'm saying it's, it's, uh, it's untestable in that sense it, and and the size of these things but people don't are untestable too well in the, in the sense that Right. If we do, if we give them a task, there's certainly. I mean, psychology I'm is still with a these task. Things, you give them tasks, and you, can, and you can see the task they still fail at. So yeah. you can understand that they don't really understand things properly in the sense people do by the fact they can't deal properly with Winograd sentences. They can do some of them, but if you now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. What's Winograd sentences? Okay. If I tell you. The trophy would not fit in the suitcase because it was too big. Oh. It refers to trophy, right? Yeah. But if I say the trophy would not fit in the suitcase because it was too small, it refers to suitcase. I see. Okay. And if you translate those two sentences into French, you have to know whether you sh the it refers to trophy or suitcase because they're different genders in French. Right. 
Uh, but you okay. can't translate that sentence into French without resolving the ambiguity about what it refers to. And that depends on real world knowledge about how big things don't fit into small things. I see. And maybe on Doctor Who. I see, I see. Um, but, but, but that's, a, I, I, I wouldn't have, so, okay, the Winograd part of it, I wouldn't have, Linguists would not talk that way or, or refer to Winograd. They would refer to what you say as there's some kind of, you know, world context in which this was, you need this to know was, small. Yeah, the Winograd words. sentences were put up by um, very good symbolic people like Hector Levesque as a real test. Yeah. For these yeah, I saw and that. Hector Levesque view. I Hector saw Levesque. that, and I asked some other linguists what Winograd sentences, and they said, "We've ne I never heard of that." No, so I, I just. Uh, just saying, there, there's a there's a grain of salt to be taken with that. No, it's comparison. not a grain of salt. It is a very good test. It's a test of whether you really understand. I, the the test the, the test is fine. I'm just I'm just uh, 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 twittering about the you know the context of the Winograd or something. But the, but yeah, the test is fine. I agree. If you don't have real world knowledge and you don't have enough experience with small suitcases and large suitcases and big trolleys, you're going to have trouble interpreting what's going on. I, I, but the point is. Once they can do that, yeah, then it's going to be quite hard to say they didn't understand. But they may need more contextual information, along with you know maybe it maybe it's a visual context of of you know seeing suitcases and trophies together and understanding something about the large and small relational structures they're looking at. I and I agree with you. This this the 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 GPT thing is impressive and amazing, and it's very much what again we were trying to do in the eighties by just training on lots of uh, you know text and trying to understand if you know the system would understand language or so on and, and so I, let me make, let me make one more comment about this. sure so i thought once you could get neural nets to translate from one language to a very different language people would stop saying they didn't understand because how could you translate to a different language if you didn't understand but people kept on saying they didn't understand um some a few people so right now you can get neural nets and you give them a sentence that says a hamster wearing a red hat or a phrase <laughs> say a hamster wearing a red hat right and they will draw you a picture of a hamster wearing a red hat yeah now it's quite hard to say they're just learning to convert phonemes into pixels no this is just a mapping from phonemes to pixels, no. and it's just a coincidence that it looks like a hamster with a red hat. They don't really understand. Um, no, 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 no. Once you can say a hamster with a red hat, and you can draw the hamster with the red hat, that seems to be pretty definitive evidence sure. that it understood hamster with a red hat. And I'm sure people like Gary Marcus will say, look, he doesn't even understand what a pixel is. But, um, but any normal person, if you could say hamster with right hand, they can draw one. That's pretty good evidence that you understood what you meant. I, I think, I think, I think uh, we, we shouldn't listen to Gary Marcus about anything. But uh, psychologists have spent a long time basically creating uh, task paradigms that do exactly do that. That's the point of, now we don't, we, psychologists don't really understand, you know, the, the kind of taxonomy of all these tasks, but they have certain kinds of properties that can inform us about psychological and brain activity that's relevant to the outcome. So I agree with you entirely. I don't see why that's any different from a neural network, you know, being able to, you know, draw a hamster with a red hat after hearing that. It's the same thing I would do to, you know, a 12 year old to tell whether or not they actually understood English. And they, and they would, they draw a hamster with a red hat. Now it may not look like a hamster, the hat would be red, <laughs> but it would, you know, maybe it would look like their pet cat. So I don't know. So I, I, we're, we're, I, I don't know how much time you have, but I'm enjoying this so much. I, I, I really, one of the other reasons I like doing this is because I get to talk to people that I haven't seen for a long time and actually just enjoy the conversation without, you know, fall, you know, bumping into them into a Starbucks by accident every five years. So this, this, this is something that I've enjoyed. One of the things I, I thought was uh, funny that I remembered, because I, I, I have this old video, uh, and it's got to be from the 70s, and it's, uh, it's you being interviewed by John Searle. Do you recall that at all? 
Oh, I recall that extremely well. It was a very okay. painful episode. It looked and painful. I, I was advised by, before I did it, I talked to Dan Dennis and said, should I do this? And Dan Dennis <laughs> no, said, no. no, no and so, um, <laughs> and, and, I got Searle to agree to something. I got Searle to agree yeah. that we would not talk about the Chinese remark. Oh, God, no. Please, please, no. Okay, so he agreed to that. Oh, lucky and you. So then we started the interview. Yeah. And the producer of the program was an Israeli who was a friend of John Searle's. Oh, no. <laughs> and John Searle introduced me by saying something like, today we're going to talk to Jeff Hinton. Um, uh, Jeff Hinton is connectionist, so of course he has no problem with the Chinese rule argument. <laughs> and I had to object and say, look, I didn't feel like I could say, look, you agreed just before we went on camera. You wouldn't Not to do that, that. right. I, I said, um, I had just put up an objection. And then the whole interview consisted of me being badgered by John Searle. Uh, yeah. And about halfway through, so they made an hour program, and they arrived two hours of filming to make the hour program. And then about halfway through, the Israeli producer stopped the filming, said, stop the cameras. Um, and he turned to me and said, um, you have to be more aggressive, more assertive. <laughs> And I thought, oh my God, I have to be more assertive. <laughs> I don't have to do. Well, so the the the, the only thing I <laughs> liked about the whole interview, except you, you looked terribly uncomfortable through most of it, and you were sort of sitting, staring off in a direction in a chair. Was this a BBC? Maybe I don't know, but uh, no, it was. I'm fairly sure it was ITV. ITV. But okay. The reason I'm fairly sure it was ITV is because in the there was a green room before the... Oh, room. okay. And in the green room, they gave me an envelope stuffed with money. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. No, I, I've given talk somewhere and then uh, walked in the back and they gave me an envelope of money somewhere. And I went, what's this for? <laughs> you know, well... Anyway, so uh, one of the things he did, and I, I won't try to, you know, John Schroeder, he's from the Midwest like me, and he would have this Iowa kind of, it's all Jack. <laughs> he says, what if we replaced every brain cell in your brain with a chip? And as I did that, slowly, slowly, we'd lose Jeff Hinton. He'd just disappear, right? And he finished off, and he just went on. And you said something like, uh, no. Actually, it's worse than that. It's the software. <laughs> so, and Cyril just looked at you like you just slapped him in the head with a dead fish, you know. I uh, wouldn't have said it was the software. Well, what I would have said is that if you replaced every neuron yeah. with a piece of silicon that behaved exactly the same way, yes, um, I'd still be Jeff Hinton. That's right. But yeah. but 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 that that's when he said something about AI, and he said so. He was implying that AI was this hardware kind of transference, of, and you said, "No, no, it's much worse than that." I believe that software will actually be able to simulate, you know, human yeah. intelligence someday, okay. and and you know, not neural networks, but just the idea that this was not a, this was not about hardware in the brain and so on and so forth. But but that's the thing that also struck me about your uh, persistence and consistency is that even though I don't think most if I read the hype out there and you know, talk to it, I don't think they realize how brain oriented you really are in terms of the actual learning. So that, you know, we're, we're at we're such in an early stage here of what's happening. Yes. There must be, other than back propagation, there must be other learning algorithms that are around, that are waiting to be picked out of the air by some young postdoc somewhere who's right now sitting thinking, oh, I know how this works. <laughs> and oh, it wasn't necessarily a young postdoc. It might be a very old researcher who just wants to get lucky one more time. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice of you to to point that out. Uh, so I'm going to I'm gonna call it the end. This was just so much fun. I, en I enjoyed it a lot, and it's good to see you. I hope you... Uh, are doing well with uh, with our uh, our days of plague here, which I think are I think based on evolutionary theory, we're we're, we're towards the end. It, it seems like one species is killing off the other species at this point, so we're we're probably in a good shape. All right, well uh, I'm going to uh, say uh, see you around. Okay. Take thanks care, Jeff. Thanks thanks so much. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.